Kangaroo. A quick thanks before we start the show. Filmmaking Confidential, the book, is getting rave reviews from readers, filmmakers, film professors, and even people in creative fields other than filmmaking. I just want to say thank you to all of you who ordered it and for your support. If you haven't yet picked it up and you want to learn more filmmaking secrets, Filmmaking Confidential is for you. It's available wherever books are sold in most countries around the world. Order it by visiting Audible or Amazon. To find out more, check out filmmakingconfidential.com and stevebalderson.com. And thank you. I'm Steve Balderson, and you're listening to the Filmmaking Confidential podcast. Each week, we meet with filmmakers, writers, actors, artists, and other notables. Many episodes include questions or commentary from other filmmakers listening to the conversation. Today's guest is Amanda Divert, an award-winning writer of comic books, film, and TV. She's also an award-winning actress who made an appearance in my ridiculous telenovela film, Helltown, as the hilariously wonderful bitch, Chanel. There was a cute guy named Jason that came into the cream cup the other day, right after your bitch-ass sister threw her ice cream at me. She did what? Yeah, in front of the customers and the manager. She could have cost me my career. I hate her. I know she's her sister, but... No, I understand, Chanel. Sometimes she laughs at the gay jokes my dad makes towards me, even though she doesn't know what it means. The cunt! Oh, please. She thinks she's better than everybody else, and she's not. She'll see. She will pay. I'll make sure of it. You can see Helltown on Amazon Prime Video. Amanda's vast body of work includes writing for DC Comics for titles such as Wonder Woman 77 and a story in New York Times number one bestseller, Love is Love. Her television credits include work for Netflix, CBS, Sci-Fi, OWN, Pivot, Hulu, and the former Quibi, which was still in business when we spoke. As head writer for former Vice President Al Gore's international climate broadcast, 24 Hours of Reality, Amanda was on location in Paris, France, on November 13th, 2015, when a series of coordinated terrorist attacks took place. My first year uh, writing for uh, former Vice President Gore for 24 Hours of Reality, it was right before the, the Paris Agreement was signed. So we're talking uh, late 2015. It was November of 2015. And um, I had written the whole script here in Los Angeles, which was the 520 pages. So it's, it's a broadcast. And basically the idea is that it goes around the world. There's like a hub where like the main people are, where Vice President Gore is, where a lot of guests come. But then there's also hubs around the world that we hit via satellite so that we're kind of in prime time in different places around the world as we're around the world. And it's a very like global broadcast. So because it was right before the Paris agreement, we went to Paris. So we were live at the base of the Eiffel tower. We had this beautiful like dome that was see-through that was our set. So you could see the Eiffel tower doing its, you know, beautiful lights every hour. I mean, it was just like a very spectacular place. Um, and we're, there and we go live um the evening of uh the 13th and uh we go live duran duran's there they open up they're on our stage they play it's great we're uh we talk to different people dignitaries celebrities all these things we're live for a couple hours when um the isis attacks that happened in paris that year uh started happening uh, simultaneously while we were live, so at the Bataclan, at the, at the various sites. Um, and President Hollande was supposed to be coming from the soccer match that he was at when they struck to our set. Um, and so it all started to happen. Half of our, our crew were Parisian, so they're getting you know frantic phone calls. They're worried about loved ones. We're also at the base of the Eiffel Tower. We have uh, people from the Obama administration, with us, we have the mayors of Paris with us. So we're, and we have you know, former Vice President Gore, we have dignitaries, we have celebrities, and we're like um, concerned that we might be a target uh, for all those obvious reasons. And also the Eiffel Tower being a symbol as it is. Um, and, uh, and we're just sitting out in the open. And so President Hollande sent uh, 
some military to come like surround us, but we had to shelter in place. But we also stayed live because there's the diplomacy situation of the vice, uh, former vice president of the United States can't give a statement from Paris before the president of France has given a statement. So we, we just stay live, but we don't want to be live from the base. So we keep going to the satellite to our host in Brazil. And we're like, we're staying in Brazil. We're staying in Brazil. So we're on the fly giving our Brazilian hosts more and more things to say. We're running music videos that certain recording artists had um, pre-recorded for us to play at certain and we're just like loading them and loading them in. So like we're playing all these music videos. We're staying live. We're trying to figure out stuff. So I'm on the fly trying to, because that's my job. I, I, it's live. So I write all the scripts before, but things happen on the fly. And my job is to write the copy for the host that might happen on the fly to help them fill in for, you know, any crazy thing that might happen. Only in this case, it was like the most crazy thing. And um, I personally had a 10 month old. It was the first time I had ever left her um, for any amount of time or gone anywhere. So she was home in Los Angeles with my wife. I was still like, so I was, I was concerned about that. They were concerned about me. So it was just, it was a lot. And oh, we stayed live for a couple more hours and then we had to continue to shelter in place. Even after we were able to go off air, we had to stay where we were because it wasn't safe for us to like go back to our hotels or go anywhere. And so we stayed for hours and hours. And then finally, they let us, like, just go back to our hotels. And we went back to our hotels. Um, we drank every bottle of wine in the vicinity of, like, we drank all the wine in Paris that night. No, because nobody was going to sleep. Everyone was worried. The, the woman running our hotel, her brother had been at the concert, and she didn't know if he was okay. You know, I mean, it was just such a vulnerable um, raw thing. Everyone was scared. Everyone was sad. Everybody. And, the, and the, in the days after, um, it was kind of an amazing time to be there because everyone was so united and, uh, and the French are fucking resilient, if nothing, um, as a lot of them were just out in cafes the very next day when they hadn't even caught anyone on the loose or really knew what happened. Um, but yeah, it was, um, it was a very interesting time to be live. It was a very interesting time to try to write on the fly. <laughs> and when anybody says anything about a stressful job, I laugh. That is incredible. <laughs> um, my, f I mean, it's uh, it, every time I hear it, it's just I can't even believe that that's coming out of your mouth. I'm just like, oh my god, Same. that's in insane. <laughs> um, how do you? Is there a trick on how you are able to keep the focus in having to write something and be creative, or at least spinning the wheels in a moment like that? I, you know, I think it's just on one hand, it's so. You're like, oh, great, I have something to focus on because everything's crazy. And the scenarios you're going to work up in your mind is that, like, you don't know if somebody's going to come around the corner and that's it. Um, so, you know, in a way, having something to focus on of, like, what music videos should we cut to? What should we have the host in Brazil say? And, like, also they have a translator who has to then, like, throw it into Portuguese on the fly. Like, you know, there's all these, like, things. And so having all the, the moving parts to think about, um, I actually think was a, a bit helpful. Um, I also, you know, my background, how I started in TV writing was live daily. So I am used to like a high pressure, very fast. You can't have writer's block because there's no time. So you just like, you have to write something because they have to say something. So good, good enough sometimes is, is the best you can do. Um, but yeah, that's kind of it. Would you say that the, the experience of writing for live TV um, was a muscle that you didn't know you had or that was developing throughout that process? Um, yeah, I, I owe a lot to the fact that I started in, in live, I think. Like, it's, it's changed so much about me as a writer and as a person. Um, just, just in general, I mean, that, even that experience aside is, um, is just because of that, I think, you know, the most val valuable thing is, is what I just said, is like, you don't have time to have writer's block. You don't get to get precious. You want to do the best you can, but there's this idea of like, if you come in uh, when you start, but you know, you're going to be taping that day at four and whatever you have written between now and four is what somebody's going to go on television and say, um, you got to, so you, you end up like shitting out your first draft very quickly and then rewriting because that's, that's the time that you have. And I think, um, even though I don't 
do live, like I have, I'm not doing anything live right now. It still helps me to uh, be very quick about getting a first draft out to not agonize if I feel like something's not right, because I know like, you know what, I'm going to come back to that. Like, I don't like that sentence, but I'll, I'll deal with that sentence later because let me get to the gist of what I want to say. And then sometimes a lot of times what happens is you realize you can just cut that sentence because everything else actually works with that. Like I found more times than anything that the sentence that I wanted to spend three hours agonizing on once I write everything else doesn't even need to be there in the first place because it was just a bridge I thought I needed that I didn't. Um, oh, but, that's interesting. Yeah. That's a really good tool. I mean, I talk a little bit about that in my book where I talk about like <clears throat> when I'm working on something, which since we've co-written together, you're familiar with mm -hmm. this too. It's like mm -hmm. you come along to the scene. You don't know at that moment what the scene should be. You just know that it needs to be there. Right. So you just put like a place card, hold, placeholder, mm -hmm. right? And then keep going. Um, although th I don't know if I've ever had the situation where I've gone back and said, oh, I don't need that scene or that line or anything like that. I think that's cool. I think that's really fascinating. And next time I'm doing that, I'm going to ask myself, do I even need that line? Because that's a really cool thing. I mean, it's not always, but I found it to be true more often than, than, than not. Um, is that if I'm really, really stuck on something, that usually it's actually the next thing that I'm actually trying to get to or it's something earlier yeah. that needed to be fit, you know, but it's, 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 not, it's usually not, the problem's usually not right there. It's either earlier that I needed to set it up better or that right after I'm going to say it and it'll be redundant. Totally. And I can see how that, I mean, if you're used to the idea of um, just getting it out, you know, throwing it on the wall and deal with it later um, helps you in any number of other mediums whether it's you know comics or tv or, or you know not live but just any sort yes. of sort of thing um when when you went into live tv do, do you remember the first few moments was it difficult at first or was it just always just go with it um sure it was it was it was difficult at first and I got that, you know, I got, I got lucky the first thing, which wasn't live. It was like live to tape, which is like a little bit of a cheat. But the first thing I ever did was a very short little show on Hulu. That was like their first foray into original content. So this was like way back in uh, the end of 2010. Um, I was, uh, I started as the writer's assistant on a show called the morning after, which was just like a comedy, like kind of like recap thing. And then I quickly, I was promoted to the writing staff. And so like that got me used to like the really quick because it was, we'd come in at like two and tape at like 8 PM, like 2 PM and tape at like 8 PM. And so I always had to write some sort of like extended joke, full, full of B roll monologue. That was usually like a couple minutes long in, um, in just a few hours. And so that, that helped me build the muscle. And then I went to like real live uh, show on Pivot shortly after that. And um, it's kind of being thrown to the wolves, but you also, because you're doing it daily, you also kind of get in the habit of like, okay, I didn't love that one, but tomorrow there's a whole new one. And I have now forgotten about that because I have five more episodes to take, you know? And so like, you also kind of learn to like get over it when you have a swing and a miss. And of, of course, everything's like good enough to go on TV and like you've got other people above you that are looking at things and making sure that you haven't just like completely ruined the show. But you, you do kind of learn that like it, they're not all going to be the most amazing thing you've ever written and that's okay. Do you have any writing rituals? Mm. Oh, I wish. <laughs> you don't have time. You don't have time for rituals. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, I was going to say as a, as now a mother in a pandemic, um, I am writing while helping teach distance kindergarten. Um, so it's like literally me at the dining room table, my daughter right next to me, me writing and then helping her like get set up. Okay. This is how you're going to do this math page. This is what you're going to do. Okay. And then while she's doing it to do, do, then I'm checking it. Then we're talking and playing. So it's, um, any even illusion of uh, a ritual has kind of gone out the window. I mean, I do generally, I like to, if I can, I like to have uh, music playing with no lyrics because lyrics distract me. I like to have a good cup of coffee or a good glass of wine, depending on the time of day and like light a candle or some incense and like 
that's my ideal situation. <laughs> <laughs> but I haven't had that in a, in a very long time, so. <laughs> I understand. I asked because one time, I think it was for my second movie, I, I had this whole thing, I don't know what I was thinking, but I had this like mirror, this like huge like table mirror that I put down and then I had candles and I had, I decided to write it in ballpoint pen and I put it on like, you know, paper, like physical, like notebook paper. And like, I had all this stuff. And I think I did also have like classical music with no lyrics or anything. But it was like I was making a seance in order to create this thing. Um, and I had never done that since. But I, I yeah, always nice. like think about like, ooh, maybe there could be, you know, some kind of like trick. And along that line, do you prefer or is it the same uh, creating or writing during the day versus the night with the sun out versus the sunset? I like both. I used to be, I used to be a night writer, um, much more hardcore. Um, but now I tend to be like so tired from a long day with uh, my daughter that I'm not quite, I don't go quite as late into the night anymore unless I really have to. Like if I've really just got to bang something out, then I will. The time of day is kind of same diff to me. It's just if I can get some quiet time and actually write, then I'm happy with it. I am a, um, I am a notebook user. Like I am not, I know some people keep everything in their computers and do it all, their notes and whatever. Even if I'm, even if I have to do a digital outline, like for television, like for He-Man, for example, like you have to turn in an outline before you can ever turn in a script. And they're very detailed. I mean, it's scene by scene outlines that are just like really comprehensive. But even then, I will still have like my first pass at an outline is still in a notebook. Like, and my notes to myself, if I think of something I want to put in later, like there's something about pen to paper for me that, um, that I can't live without. <laughs> when did you start writing? Like, do you remember how old you were or like what sort of caused you to put a story down? on something? Oh, I mean, for, for always. I have, uh, I have like a, a ledger that was like one of my grandfather's like ledgers that he would use for accounting that I took over and made like Amanda's book of mini stories and that I wrote and illustrated that I would like then read to my cousin who was younger. Um, and that I was probably like four or five when I started doing that. I was, I've always been a storyteller. I won like, you know, like a little like, you know, local newspaper story writing competition when I was in elementary school. Like it was always a thing I was doing. Like I was always, I've always been a writer and a reader. I was that kid that was just like, you know, hook my arm around my mom's in the grocery store so that I could keep reading without running into things. Do you remember what was your first book that really shaped or like influenced you? Mm. Um... I mean, I think it's a little girl, probably like the Anne of Green Gables books. Um, I remember being really, really obsessed with those as a little girl. But I was, I was a voracious reader. I read, I read things that probably like, you know, I was reading classics that I, like, I probably shouldn't have read Jane Eyre before middle school, but like I did. Um, it, I was, I was just just books in general shaped me. Like I was constantly, constantly escaping into a book, constantly, constantly reading. Do you have any uh, favorites uh, currently? Um, one of my favorite books of all time is Neil Gaiman's American Gods. Um, it really hits my sweet spot of mythology and fantasy and reality. And um, I just... Uh, I love that one a lot, but I have, I mean, my favorite book list is, is long. Writer Amanda Divert. Another great guest of Filmmaking Confidential who's traveled the world is The Enigma. Being part of the Lollapalooza sideshow, which at that point, you know, Lollapalooza was a amazing thing 92 should have been called the William Morris Agency Sideshow because they're the ones that put us all around the world and I became the most famous tattooed man in history because of that I remember we played we opened for Nine Inch Nails in in Madison Square Garden two sold out nights and you know I stayed in a squat <laughs> in the freezing cold you can get a link to my full interview with The Enigma at filmmakingconfidential.com or by subscribing for free to this podcast. When we come back, Amanda shares more about writing under pressure, what she's currently working on, and we'll take some questions from the audience listening in to our conversation right after this. Hi. 
I'm Steve Balderson, and this is the Filmmaking Confidential Podcast. I'm back with Amanda Dibert. Right now, I am writing uh, for the new upcoming animated He-Man on Netflix. Um, wrote several episodes of season one. Very excited about that. I also have a show that I'm the head writer, supervising producer of on Quibi that's called Sexology. And so where as He-Man is an animated and, uh, you know, fictional narrative story, sexology is about sex and relationships and dating advice. And it's, you know, more akin to being a, a talk show. Um, but with, you know, a kind of a more sexual and heavier things like double penetration or dildos or, you know, whatever uh, the case may be. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and then I'm also, uh, I've also written for, uh, like, uh, for four years, I was the writer for Vice President Al Gore's uh, 24 Hours of Reality, which is an international climate broadcast, which would film live around the globe for 24 hours. And I wrote the entire 520 page script uh, all four years and would stay in the control room for 36 hours straight without going to bed uh, while we were live. Um, and I've also, you know, done a smattering of different kinds of TV stuff. I'm also a comic book writer. I write for DC Comics. I do, uh, right now I'm doing DC Superhero Girls. I also just did for Halloween, uh, DC's The Doomed and the Damned, which I have a, a horror Wonder Woman and Raven team up. Um, I also did John Carpenter's Tales for Halloween Night. This is, I think, volume six, but I'm in um, every volume from volume two. I do a horror story uh, that I team up with my wife, who's an illustrator, Kat Staggs, um, and we do horror stories uh, for that every year. Um, but yeah, a lot of comic books, a lot of TVs, a lot of different genres. Um, I occasionally write essays and things like that as well. What's your favorite, if you had to say, your favorite genre of, no matter what the, the platform? Mm. Um, I, it's, it's, it's twofold. I have found that I actually really like writing um, like middle grade and for, for children. I think that the, the response is so like, I don't know, like so un unfiltered, so unpretentious, so whatever, you know, you get to be kind of more raw and vulnerable in your writing. It's all right on the surface. And then the kids' responses to it are also so like kind of like open and there's no, no pretense in between. Um, so I love doing that. I love writing for kids. And then my other favorite is actually the horror writing. I have found to be a lot more fun uh, than I ever anticipated when getting into it. I mean, I remember the first time that Sandy King Carpenter asked me to write for a, a volume two of John Carpenter's Tales for a Halloween Night. She's like, I'm going to drag you into horror. And I was like, sure. And then I was like, oh God, I love this. <laughs> and so I've been uh, doing it ever since. Not just with live, but with any project you've ever worked on, where was the moment with the most interference that sort of kept you from really saying what you felt needed to be said? And, and on the flip side, what was the one with the least interference? You know, it, it really goes, I mean, for the most part, I've been lucky in that I haven't had, a, I haven't had the experience of having a boss who's like, no, you can't write this. Like, no, like if there is something, it'll be um, because like, oh, legal came back and we can't legally say this or do this for some reason that has to do with like, you know, we don't have the rights to this or like, whatever. Um, I haven't had any kind of situation where I've just felt um, like really stifled. Um, I, you know, I think actually the 24 hours of reality was probably one of the most mind-blowingly loose situations I ever had where it was a boss. I had worked uh, for the executive producer on um, another late night show and then he was executive producing 24 Hours of Reality, and he brought me on to write it. And he was just like, um, yeah, Amanda can write this. This is, this is fine. They had the, the years before, they had had a writer who was uh, a writer from Colbert, and she wasn't available that year. And so my boss was just like, yeah, Amanda can do it. She can do it. And I came in, and I kind of figured at some point, like, someone would show me the ropes or 
whatever. And they were just like, write the show. It was like, I was like, oh my gosh. And I was so scared and I was so intimidated and there was so much focus and it was like all over the world and all these high profile people. And then it was totally fine. And I think actually him like just having that trust in me and being like, oh, this will be fine. Uh, gave me the, the like, oh, I guess if he thinks it'll be okay, it'll be okay. <laughs> that's so crazy. I know. <clears throat> well, and that's why I was curious because I, you sometimes think that something like that would be super, you know, controlled and not loose at all or just really, you know, structured. And then you'd think that, you know, the, the least thing would have been like something that would have, you would have thought the otherwise, you know, the other side. I have found, and I found this to be true in comics, I found this to be true in films, I found this to be true in TV, um, that in general, it's like the bigger a project, the bigger the company, the bigger the whatever, the more faith they've put in me, at, because it's like, we hired you for the reason, it's you that we want, it's this. And the smaller something is, and I think it's a lot of times because, uh, because the smaller things are greener, that that tends to be where people want to hold on to control a little more and micromanage a little more and, uh, and hang on to it. And I think it has to do with like, once you get to a certain level where you're used to working with people who are the best at what they do, you just kind of trust that they are the best at what they do. Um, cause I, found, so you know, I, mean, I mean, of course, like there's legal people looking over everything to make sure you don't have diplomatic problems. And there's scientists looking over all the climate things to make sure that you're not saying something that isn't sound but other than that it's like go for cool. it that's amazing yeah amanda do you have to write in people's voices you say you write quick and i know some some news people have their own rhythms and all of that do you have to be aware of that yeah that's a that's a special skill that i've definitely honed over the years um it's easier to write for people if I've gotten to know them or I've written for them before. Like Shan Boudram, who's the host of Sexology, I wrote for her on a previous show. So I've worked with her for like four years so I can write in her voice uh, fairly easily. Um, and sometimes, I mean, you want to hit as close to people's voices as possible. So um, you do what you can. Sometimes uh, it's not always possible, but, uh, but yeah. When you write for someone's voice, like Bono, um, does he say what you've written or does mm -hmm. he say whatever he wants? It's, you know, it's a toss up. So like with things like that, where you're writing like a really quick, like, like, oh, this celebrity is just going to say this thing for this PSA. Um, usually it's a little more of a roadmap and you know, they're going to ad lib their own stuff. Um, but sometimes people will stick to verbatim what you write. So you try to get it to be at least kind of the way they would say it. Like you want to, you don't want to have them sounding like, I don't know, uh, a teenager when they're not, or really slangy when that's not how they speak, or really stilted when that's not how they speak. But then, yeah, most of the time when you're talking about live stuff or host copy or things for celebrities, like usually people will sprinkle in a bit of their own personality as well. And you want that. Yeah, I was going to say, um, briefly worked in television here well, locally, and Steve knows this person, but uh, one of the major anchors here you would write whatever you wanted to for him and he would just scan, like even live, would just scan it and pick out show's words that would trigger whatever you'd say. So, um, yeah, uh, I was just always curious to see that that, he always called him the local Ron Burgundy because kind of like the opposite, he wouldn't read it verbatim. He would just pick and choose what he wanted off of a script and then make it his own. Interesting. That's pretty common. I mean, especially for people who've been doing it for a long time. I mean, the more yeah, experienced somebody is with that, yeah. the more they're going to do it. Yeah. Does anybody else have anything for the moment? Can I say? Please, please. Oh, sorry, I didn't know if you could hear, if you heard me or not. Uh, first of all, thank you, Steve, for hosting this um, event. And I bought your book and I'm oh, holding cool. it. <laughs> yeah, I like to hold it. And Amanda, thank you so much for sharing your experience. It's incredible. And um, it's just amazing to me that you guys can share such things. And I mean, in film school, you pay a lot of money for this, <laughs> you know? I mean, I've never been to a film school. I bought a Mercedes instead. 
Just kidding. Like in your book where you're saying you pay so much for <laughs> the film school, you might as well just buy a Mercedes. And so I was going to go to a film school. Uh, instead, I uh, bought a Mercedes. So <laughs> I, didn't go, I didn't go to a film school. So I was laughing when I was reading that part when you wrote. You, um, actually, you actually bought a Mercedes instead of going to film school. Yeah. Instead of going, <laughs> that's great. Yeah, that's I was, why just... I was laughing. I was laughing. Oh. I thought I could make a movie, anyways. I mean, uh, you know, I could, I could do it. I just need to meet people like you guys. And uh, I mean, the I, I believe the experience you're sharing it's even more valuable than the the school because the school they kind of force you to think a certain way. And it's just so cool when you're able to talk to like people like Amanda, like, and you, Steve, and like discover different things from, it's just, I think it's so amazing, you know? Well, and, you. and you are an experienced filmmaker. I mean, you were doing it just the same with Amanda, an experienced writer. So, Amanda, you said that you wrote um, a pilot, a horror film. Could you tell uh, a little bit, like, how long is your pilot? And because I'm working, I need to write a pilot myself, but I don't know, like, what uh, the format is and what I need to do. So, so yeah, I met uh, a producer today, and I just, I, I need to send him a pilot, and I'm thinking on how to better presented so the the best thing that I would do because there's a lot of um there's a lot of differences in in how long they are and um how they're set up the best thing I would recommend is thinking about a couple of shows that are similar in in genre uh to mm -hmm. what you want to write mm -hmm. and then um looking up a lot of times the pilot scripts are available online. Like it's pretty easy to find a lot of scripts. Uh, there's a site called Drew Scriptorama that has a lot of scripts on it. Um, and then there's just, I mean, if you Google, you can Drew D R E W mm -hmm. that has a bunch. Um, but there's also like just Google uh, whatever shows you think are similar and you'll find. Um, and then I would look at, look at a couple of them and kind of notice where the page breaks are for your page counts for, you know, act one, act two, if it's, you know, because there's going to be a big difference if you're doing like a half hour comedy versus like a, an hour long drama. There's also going to be a difference if you're doing something for um, a streaming service like Netflix versus mm -hmm. a, a network that has like commercial breaks, the page counts and the pacing are going to be a little different. Um, so look at things that are similar to what you're doing in particular is probably the best way to go for that. Uh, I, I'm not like um, a bad writer as far as like, I, I know how to convey my ideas, but the thing is I've never written like a script. And so what would you suggest for someone like, like me who've never written a script, but wants to need to do it? I mean, the same, I would, I would say looking at screenplays and seeing how they're formatted is going to teach you a lot. You know, you're going to see where, how they format the dialogue, how they write a scene description, how, you know, it, interior, bedroom, yeah. day, all that kind of stuff is going to be there. there. There are also screenwriting books um, that probably if you've never done it before, it would be a good idea to, to just grab a couple like books just on basic screenwriting. Um, but really more than anything else, looking at actual scripts that have been produced is, is going to be your best bet. And mm -hmm. likewise, you know, it's, I, I would agree and also say that truly the more scripts you can read, the more it'll just become the language you, you get used to. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit like, you know, if uh, as a filmmaker, I encourage people to be on as many film sets as possible, no matter the size. It could be the lowest no budget micro shoot with three, you know, amateur aspiring filmmakers, and it could be a studio movie. But just try to be on every film set you can, and you'll notice how, how, it's, how do you how get it, in there. How do you get in there? Um, you just uh, well, if you if you reverse engineer it from, uh, be aware. Right now, there's not much happening production wise, right. but when you see a call for actors you know, mm -hmm. or extras, you know, there's a movie happening. So then track down that production manager 
or the production coordinator and email them and ask if you could shadow uh, the director or could you come on set and shadow the producer just to be a fly on the wall for one day and, and observe. And mm -hmm. oftentimes, if it's, if it's not a, a big sort of secure uh, top secret thing, most often people are welcome to that. Um, I, if it's the wrong person or they might have a different personality and they say, get lost, maybe that'll happen once or twice. But typically, you know, if, if somebody called me up and said, hey, can I come and watch you for a day? I'm like, sure, fine. Yeah, great. Um, especially if can it's I a low budget. Can I come and shadow you? <laughs> yes, next time I'm shooting something, but who knows when that'll be. Um, the other thing I was going to recommend is just if, since it's your first, first step, into writing a screenplay or pilot or any sort of formed thing. If you ever get sort of hesitant or nervous about the structure and the way it looks, because if you look at a screenplay or a pilot, it looks very, very different than a book or an article in a magazine. Um, that's okay because you're not yet familiar with it. You might choose to handwrite it first. You know, don't worry about the format right away. Um, if you have these concepts and ideas, you know, get them out any way you can. And then mm -hmm. later on, when you become more familiar with the way that it should be formatted, mm -hmm. uh, either you can then do it yourself or you can pay someone and hire somebody to uh, translate it from your handwritten copy into uh, the format. You know, if let's say the, the producer you met with says, oh, I need something next week and you don't have time to learn it all the way, maybe you know, work with someone who can. Um, and over time, you know, you'll, you'll eventually just become familiar with it. I mean, if you get a, a software like Final Draft is very popular and it's pretty much industry standard, the, the formatting is almost automatic. It just does it for you and you don't have to worry about it. If you're trying to create the format in Word or another text-based uh, document, it's, it's going to be a headache. So my advice would be to get Final Draft and they also have some samples in the software. And if, if you're going to write a TV pilot and it's a sitcom or if it's not, or if it's a feature length, they have automatic everything pre-laid out for you and you don't have to do anything except um, pick, you know, uh, the next line or is it a character? Is it a dialogue? Is it an action, et cetera? Um, but I think, you know, spend a few days and I think it'll be more comfortable and you'll, you'll get the hang of it pretty easily. Um, I'd also add to it, if you haven't read Steve's chapter on screenwriting, definitely do that. I've been writing for 25 years and after reading his chapter and how he basically outlines his scripts, I mean, it kind of blew my mind because I was doing it so much more difficult um, over the years and I'm a self-taught screenwriter. So again, reading as many screenplays as you can find, um, just backing up what both Amanda and Steve said, but definitely just skip to that part in Steve's book too is very enlightening. Thank you so much, Jake. Mm -hmm. thank yeah, you. thank you, Jake. A listener emailed me from filmmakingconfidential.com and asked my advice about writing for improv. I have some bullet points of Okay, the scene begins at A, it has to end at C in order to continue. But B really could be anything. So as long as you start at A and end at C, you know, there are a, a hundred ways to process moving through B. And so I just, if you, if you have the resources, the time and money, you could shoot it five different ways, the, the B and then decide later which one you want to use as long as you end at C. Um, another trick might be to go ahead and write down for yourself what you think you want them to say, but just don't show them yet. And let them come on the set and give you their version of B, but at least you've got your, your bottom line uh, safely written somewhere. Okay, in a traditional screenplay, if you're going to get paid to be a screenwriter or you, you want a production company to produce it, then every line of dialogue is going to be scripted. And then, yes, uh, seasoned performers might add in their own improv or whatever. But traditionally, if you're talking traditionally, then, yes, you write out everything. But for what, you're, what sounds like you want to do, um, 
I would recommend much like Steve said, just doing beats. So, you know, that like this scene, you know, Amanda sees a beautiful woman across the room and is going to ask her out. We don't know how I'm going to do that, but we know like for the scene to end, I've got to ask her out because the next scene is going to be us on a date or whatever. Um, you can do that. You can have the beats and just, you know, give the actors just enough that they know what, what you need them to do to make the next scene work. Anything that they might need to know about their character's emotional state, like you've just come from your father's funeral, so you're really upset. That's an, an important thing, if that's something that they need to know. Um, so it, it really, you know, like he said, it really is up to you if you're, if you're doing it yourself and you want to just fully improv it, then do, but just make sure you've got your roadmap and make sure it, it is that you've got a beat for every scene that you know what needs to be accomplished so that you don't get um, lost because you're going to see all these little magical cool moments and you want to make sure you really strongly remember the thread that needs to get you through the whole thing. Writer Amanda Dybert. You can find out more about Amanda by visiting www.amandadibert.com. That's D-E-I-B-E-R-T. Tune in next time for more Filmmaking Confidential. It is totally free to subscribe, and when you subscribe, you'll get upcoming new episodes automatically, and you'll have free access to all our past shows. The Filmmaking Confidential podcast is a production of Dekanga Audio and produced by myself and Ella Spencer. Our theme music is composed by Kevin Robles, for more of the Filmmaking Confidential podcast, head over to filmmakingconfidential.com. If you have a question about filmmaking you'd like answered on the podcast, send me an email using the contact form on the website. To learn more of my filmmaking secrets, be sure to pick up a copy of the book, Filmmaking Confidential, available on Audible, paperback, and ebook, wherever books are sold. I'm Steve Balderson. Thanks for listening and spreading the word. Until next time, keep making, keep doing, keep going.